I want to speak to us uh, this morning for just a few moments, not only how we can experience a miracle or a sign, but how we can be in a position to experience wonders and signs. In Joshua, it says, Joshua chapter 6, I apologize, in Joshua chapter 3 verse 5 says, And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Ruvim, if you can be kind to give me a clock so that I um, don't, thank you. I'm going to start again. Joshua 3.5 and Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. Not just a wonder, wonders, meaning plural, more than one. There's going to be a domino effect of God's power. Tomorrow God will do wonders in your midst. Spiritual things, they work by three main principles. The right soil, the right seed, and the right season. The right soil is the environment that you are in. You cannot spiritually grow if you are in the wrong environment. Bananas do not grow in Alaska because of environment. You can have all the right decisions. If you're not in a spiritually conducive environment for growth, you won't, it won't work. Some of you, that's why you came to our church, is because this is an environment where those things will work. There's a spiritual environment, dynamic environment that is taking place. You need to be in the right environment. Somebody say environment. So there's the soil. But secondly, there has to be right seeds. See, you can be in the proper environment, but if you're not planting the seeds in that environment, you will not reap a harvest. For example, if you're in the right place, but you're not making the right decisions, you're not praying when that church is praying. On Wednesday morning, you're sleeping in when we're praying. When we're fasting, like ah, that's for somebody else. So meaning you have a really good soil, you're just not planting anything into that soil. Then what happens is that soil, even though it's fruitful in your life, you will be fruitless. It will produce weeds. It will not produce harvest. And so not only we need a right soil, we also need to plant the right seeds. But you can plant the right seeds in the wrong soil and you won't get a good harvest. And we not only need a right soil, somebody say soil, somebody say seeds. And see planting seeds are decisions is what we're going to talk about this morning. Paul says in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 6 verses 7, he says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he also will reap. For he who sows into his flesh will, so that's a soil, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows into the Spirit, so that's our environment, that's our soil. But we sow something, we'll reap out of the Spirit everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season, somebody say due season, we will reap if we do not lose heart. So we have a soil, that's our environment that we're sowing into. We have our seeds, that's the decisions we are taking. Our fasting, our prayer, our Bible reading, separation from the world. Sanctify yourselves, meaning separate yourself. That's our seeds. And then there's one more, somebody say season. The Bible says, and in the due season, meaning the moment you plant a seed, you don't get a harvest instantly. There is a season, there is what the Bible calls Kairos moment, meaning there's God's time for it when things just begin to happen. Everything was normal until it becomes not normal, becomes supernatural. Things just break through the ground, it becomes supernatural. See revival is not an accident, revival is a harvest of seeds being planted in the right soil. Revival and the spiritual breakthrough in our life is a consequence of the right environment meeting your right decision and God's right time coming for your life. I believe you are on the brink of the right time in your life. You are on the brink of the season shifting in your life because God has planted you in His house at Hungry Gen. And some of you have been praying, some of you have been fasting and you're about to step into in due season. Come on. God says to Joshua, and Joshua says that to his people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. Meaning, we're in the right place. We are in the promised land. We are in the right environment. But you need to do something. 
you need to plant the right seeds. You need to separate yourself. Meaning what was acceptable in the wilderness is not acceptable in the promised land. I know you were not circumcised for 40 years and God did miracles but God is about to do wonders. And for God to do wonders you need to plant some seeds in the soil and you won't see those wonders in a three hour it will be tomorrow meaning it will take some time but God promises when you plant seeds there will be a shift of a season. Mm. Hallelujah. Tomorrow. Today's sacrifice is tomorrow's supernatural. Today's separation is tomorrow's success. Today's sanctification is tomorrow's miracles. Today's obedience equals to tomorrow's destiny. My friend, a lot of us are discouraged to make sacrifices today because God doesn't promise that today we will reap. Today's purity is tomorrow's potential unlocked. Tomorrow's purpose blessed. But also today's disobedience is tomorrow's defeat. Today's sixth brownie is tomorrow's obesity. Hey. Today I don't want to go to college is tomorrow's poverty. Today I want to disrespect my mom and dad is tomorrow's calamity. And Joshua experienced both of them because Achan put things under his tent and everything was still fine until tomorrow, the next city, they experienced defeat. If you are in defeat right now, I don't want a guilt trip, bring Debbie the downer on you, but I want you to examine your heart. Did you allow defeat in your life yesterday? Because everything you are today is a result of what happened yesterday. And at the same time, you are creating the tomorrow. Not in a sense that you are a creator, but in a sense that you are a farmer. God created the laws that we have to work with. And these are the laws of sowing and reaping. Sometimes He suspends those laws temporarily, but He does not suspend them permanently. The laws are this, what you sow is what you reap. If you want your life to change in the next five years, if you want your spiritual life to change in the next five days, sanctify yourselves today. Separate yourself today because tomorrow, says the Lord, I want to do wonders in your midst. God wants to do wonders at Hungry Gen, where the church will not be as usual, where Sunday morning services will not be predictable, not because we moved worship from the beginning till the end, but because God will move you from sickness to health. Because God will move somebody from bondage into freedom. Because God will move somebody from being lost to being found. My God is still in the business of doing miracles. He makes dead things alive. He makes lost people be found. God heals the sick. He still provides supernaturally. And this God is saying, I want to do wonders in your midst. But you got to prepare yourself by separating yourself. That means what was acceptable in the previous season is no longer okay in this season. Why? Because you have something promised that I want to release in your life. Revival is our portion. Revival is not a set of meetings. Revival is a lifestyle. That's a harvest of us recognizing we are in the right environment. We are making right decisions. And we are patiently waiting for God to supernaturally add His super to our natural. Amen. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 20 through 21 and 22, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, watch this, if anyone, God doesn't place the responsibility upon himself to separate, to sow, but he places responsibility on anyone. Therefore, God says, in my house, there is vessels for honor, vessels for dishonor. Therefore, how would you become a vessel of honor? How would you be qualified to see God's glory in your life? God says, if anyone cleanses himself, if anyone separates himself. Now, we don't initiate separation. The Spirit does. 
we respond to the Spirit. How is the Spirit initiated? Sometimes making you dissatisfied with the status quo. You're just not happy with where your Christian life is. You're like, man, there is more to Christian life. And you realize that state of dissatisfaction is initiation and an invitation of the Holy Ghost. He's inviting you to separate yourself. And Paul says, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will become a vessel of on, for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also useful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace with those who call on the name of the Lord. My friend, the difference between salvation and sanctification is the following. Salvation occurs instantly. God saves us instantly. Sanctification occurs gradually. Salvation requires faith. Sanctification requires surrender or it requires yielding. Salvation is final. You're saved, you're saved. You don't have to add anything to it. Your good works doesn't add anything. It, you, there's no upgrade. But sanctification is growth. You're growing. Salvation removes the penalty of sin. Sanctification resists the desire of sin. Are you following me? Salvation is God's desire for all to be saved. Sanctification is God commands all to be sanctified. It's not His desire. It's His command for you. It's His command for me. He says, cleanse yourself. He says, choose my words. My Spirit initiates that process. You have to respond. Salvation is you getting out of the world. Sanctification is God getting the world out of you. Salvation is your eternal destination being changed. Sanctification, it's your character being transformed. So what I'm talking about right now, please hear me loud and clear. We do not believe that if you improve your Christian life, you are more saved. We are not more saved or less saved. We are saved. Not by church attendance, not by doing ordinances. We are saved by the blood, by the grace, through faith. Amen. But you can be saved and stuck. You can be saved and stagnant. You can be saved and chosen frozen. You can be saved and not be in revival but be in a rut. You can be saved and be in a religion instead of being in a renewal. Why? Because you're stuck in here instead of going to the next step. You can be saved and talk like the devil, look like the devil, drink like the devil, smoke like the devil, do everything like the devil and still call yourself saved. That's why we have to move from the position of salvation into sanctification so that we can step into the promises of God, into the purpose of God, into the power of God, into the wonders of God, into the glory of God. Somebody say Amen. If you're watching us, drop that fire emoji. Let us know that you're with us. Now practically, how do we do that? Let me just give you few practical things that we can take home. I want you to open Isaiah with me chapter 40 and verses 3 through 5. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the in the desert the highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain hill, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth and the glory of the Lord somebody say the glory the glory of the Lord shall be revealed have you noticed Joshua said the same thing you will see the wonders of God uh, Paul said to Timothy that you will be a vessel of honor the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it shall see it together for the mouth of God has spoken now we know this is a prophetic verse concerning the coming of Messiah the glory of God and John the Baptist coming before Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus. I want you to notice five things that we need to do. And if you're taking notes, write this down, is that repentance precedes revival. You can't have Jesus without John the Baptist. In other words, you cannot have the glory of God in your life without having some kind of a construction work of John the Baptist in your character, in your budget, in your finances, in how you speak and how you live. 
Many people want the wonders. They don't want God to fix our highway and fix our way and fix our life. And we call that legalism. We call that, ah, this is just, these people, they're just super, you know, self-righteous. And we ignore that. But in reality, my friend, that is sanctification. And you cannot have the supernatural without the sanctification. I'm not talking about sanctification so you can be holier than thou. I'm talking about sanctification as a preparation for what is about to come. Amen. The first thing I want you to write down is this, is that this way has to be made in the wilderness, which means it will most likely not be the right time for you. You won't feel like doing it. Preparing the way in the wilderness. Wilderness is hot. Wilderness is not a place where you want to build a road. Wilderness is just not comfortable. When you are in a spiritual wilderness, you have convinced yourself that you don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like reading the Bible. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like fasting. I am in a dry place. The place I am in is a wasteland. And it's interesting, God says, in that way, God says, I want to build a highway. You know when is the right time to get ready for revival? Right now. Oh, but I have a birthday party right after this. It doesn't matter. Right now is the time. You know when is the right time to make a decision to stop sleeping with your girlfriend? In the next 30 seconds. Okay, in the next three seconds. Right now. Even my watch is speaking right now. Oh my goodness. This is spiritual maybe. Do you know when is the time to start tithing? In your wilderness right now. Do you know when the time is to make a decision? I'm going to start reading God's Word right now. I know you're a college student. I know you have a full-time job and you're full-time in college. But right now begin to build a highway for God in your wilderness and in your highway and in your wasteland. Amen. Okay, that was a golf clap and I felt like half of you were like, man, uh-uh, I'm not laughing for that. I'm not going to be responsible for that word in my life. <laughs> Discouragement is what the enemy will use to make excuses for why we are in the spiritual rut. Make up your mind. If you're sick and tired of the way Christian life is for you, if you're dry, you're empty, and you're like, there has to be more, those feelings are not just your dissatisfaction. It could be a signal from the Holy Spirit. Sanctify yourself. Let's build a highway in the middle of the wilderness. And if you are in Troy Cities, you are in wilderness. So it's time to build a highway for God. It's time to prepare the way for the Lord. It's time to seek the face of God. It's time to humble yourself before God. It's not enough to be in a revival church and not to have revival in your life. It's time to set aside your plate and fast and seek God. It's time to wake up earlier and seek His face. It's time to stay up late and be in His Word. It's time to separate yourself from ungodliness. My friend, this is the time. Now is the time and do you are in the right place for that to happen. Come on somebody. Number two, not only he says that the way has to be made in the wilderness, he says that the high and the hill has to come down. Preparing yourself for revival means that every pride thing has to come down. You cannot walk in holiness without humility. Water flows from the mountain but it always stays in the valley. If you look at the water in your lawn, if you look at the water in your driveway, it will always be collected at the lowest places. It can spray everywhere, but it stays only in the places that are lower than others. Same thing is with the power of God and same thing is with the grace of God. God's grace will touch anybody and everybody, but it only stays on people who are low. Not I'm talking about low in the sense that you think of yourself ugly, worthless, fat, no good. and No, no, no. I'm talking about low that you have a humble opinion about yourself and you live your life not about you. Where you can allow yourself to be a little bit offended and you don't take it personally. Where you don't come to church because of other people, you come to church because of God. And you don't live your life in offense and you don't live your life in entitlement, arrogance and pride. Ego is like fingernails. It needs to get trimmed regularly. And sometimes God will cause our pride to be injured by the people closest to us and instead of 
trimming our pride, we trim relationships that caused our pride to be exposed. Come on somebody. Bring that hill down. Bring that mountain down. Don't switch churches, switch your attitude. Don't switch spouses, switch your attitude. Bring that pride down because in humility is where your holiness is. In humility is where the glory of God is. In humility is where God gives more grace. In humility, God gives more miracles. In humility, God exalts when you humble yourself. Woo! Come on. Number three, not only John says, uh, Isaiah says that John, and then John repeats it that every hill must come down. He says that every valley must be exalted. And this means that low things must rise. Fear, anxiety, insecurity, inferiority, timidity has to come up. And there's the sweet balance where cockiness comes down and then insecurity has to come up. Meaning if you feel like I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, it's still about you. You have to switch it to God. Where He is worthy and I have faith. Where fear has to be replaced with faith. Where insecurity has to be replaced with identity. If you walk around with this, God won't use me. I want you to begin to fill that valley and that was me. My problem was not that I had a big hill. I had a long deep valleys. Valleys not in the sense of humility, but it went deeper than humility. It went into ungodly false humility. I'm ugly. I'm worthless. I'm no good. God has no purpose and a plan for my life and revival before revival comes. God looks at Moses and says, Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt and you will speak and Moses says, God, I, 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 I stutter. And God says, I am the one who causes men to speak and not to speak, meaning this valley has to be filled. God comes to Jeremiah and says, I want you to prophesy. He says, I'm just a youth. God says, don't say you're just a youth because this valley has to be filled. Inferiority, insecurity. Maybe people called you ugly. Maybe people called you, you know, no good. Maybe people called you with racist slur. You need to fill that valley. Why? Because you are not defined by your past. You are defined by the cross. You are defined by the blood. You are defined by what He did on the cross and what He says about you in His Word and the fact that His Spirit lives inside of you. God could not move in my life until that valley had to be filled. Now my faith wasn't changed but my attitude had to be changed. God doesn't just want to change everybody's view of you. He wants to change your view of you by filling it with the gravel of His promises. Do you believe what He says about you? I want you to notice the fourth thing. The Bible says not only the low things have to go up, the high things have to come down. You have to make a way in the wilderness. Crooked things have to be made straight. That means don't live your life with what I can get away with. Live your life with, can this bring me closer to Jesus or further from Jesus? Don't live your life with, well, the Bible doesn't say that drinking is sin. No, 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 that, that's crooked. It might not be wrong, but it's already crooked. And a lot of Christians live like that. They look for loopholes instead of for a way to get closer to God. If you're looking for a loophole, you'll always find one. But you'll never find yourself in revival. You'll never find yourself close to God because your goal is this, how can I maintain as much of my will and still get as much of God? You will not get you and you will miss God. You will like be like a person who's on the fence. You will try to get a little bit of God, a little bit of the world and the worst part is you'll miss both and you'll be the most miserable person. Choose this day whom you will serve. Serve the devil but serve him fully or serve God and serve Him fully. Otherwise, you will never get the benefits of both. And so what I want to encourage you today, let's not live our life in a crooked way, shady way with our finances, in the way we do our taxes, in the way we relate with other people, in the way we drink, in the way we, you know, for those of you who, who maybe you find those loopholes in what you drink, in what you watch, in how you treat other people, in how you're doing things behind the back of your wife and she doesn't see it or he doesn't see it in the way you talk and you know in your heart there is this thing where it says, you know, I, I, I don't think that I should be doing that and you silence that voice long enough and that voice will start telling you something else you're okay, you're fine and you can be completely spiritually dead inside and you will still be getting that confirmation. Why? Because the real voice of the Holy Spirit after being ignored for so long, it dies down. 
it goes mute. God wants us to live a life without blemish. He wants us to live a life without a hint of immorality. Not just like what can I get away with, but God wants us to live without a hint of immorality. Why? Because the question is not how close to the cliff I can get without falling. The question is how close to God I can stay so that I don't even think about the cliff. Oh, I just stepped on somebody's toe in the morning. I know this is early. Imagine if I would come to my wife and I say, babe, the Bible says thou shall not get commit adultery. Um, adultery is, in, uh, is intercourse. How close to another woman can I get without it being labeled as, idol as adultery in your eyes? The very idea of asking that question will put me in the grave. You guys will have a funeral in five days from now. If I will ask my wife that question, she's going to say, first of all, that's the wrong question. Why? Because we are relational. You're asking a relational question. You should be asking how close to her I can get that I don't even think about those dumb questions. And that's exactly what many Christians do is we, we come to God and because we treat God as a religion or a vending machine, we dare to ask those things and live crooked ways. But the moment you begin to walk after God, my friend, you won't be asking those dumb questions because you have a relationship that's in love with God and you say, God, I want to love you so much. I want to be with you. Now, if you don't have those, then ask Him to give you that revelation. Pay the price of having that intimacy with God. My friend, the world criticizes us because we live crooked ways, because we live shady ways, because we do people, because we cut corners, because we are loophole Christians. That's what the world has a problem with us. And that's why I'm here today to rebuke you and myself and to say it's time to make our way straight. It's time to live our life honest before God. It's time to live our life holy before God. It's time not to have a hint of immorality. It's time not to operate in the gray area. Somebody say amen. Somebody give God some praise right now. It's easy. We criticize the homosexuals. We criticize people who commit abortion. But the Bible says the judgment of God starts in the house of God. God wants to make crooked things straight. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 it says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless. See this is not about getting away with stuff. Blameless, meaning there's not even a blame. Blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault. Are you talking about perfection? No, my friend. I'm talking about living life where you're progressing in sanctification. Without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Sin is always easier to see in everybody else except yourself. And what I'm challenging us today, this is not a judgment message. Please hear me loud and clear. I'm not trying to be judgmental. What I'm saying is this, my friends. We want to live in revival. And the Bible is very clear. He wants us not to have crooked paths, crooked dealings, crooked stuff in relationships. He does not want us to live like that. We all can fall, but we have to get up and understand and stop calling crooked things straight. Amen. Now, if you're not a Christian, one thing I do know about you, deep inside you're like, yeah, finally somebody told them, told them the Christians, because you expect it from us. You expect for us not to be perfect, but not to be crooked. <laughs> you want to deal with a Christian in the business and you want to know he's not going to dupe you. He's not going to cut corner. You, you're expecting that out of a Christian. And honestly, your expectation is correct because that is exactly what the Bible teaches us. And we as Christians, we're going to step up our game. And the last one is he said, make the rough patches smooth. Now this is the hard one because by the time you get to the fifth one and you got your life straight you're like man my God I am doing everything right before God. I'm living holy. I am putting in work. The last one hits all the people who get the first four because you develop a little bit self-righteousness and you become a little bit mean. The moment you got a lot of your ducks in a row you actually start feeling really good. And that feeling really good can lead to feeling better than other people. And you become rough. You become rough with your spouse. You become rough with your children. And God says, not only I want crooked things straight, I want your roughness out. 
and I want you to be smooth. Even all of, the, all of you rough men who like the Harley Davidsons and you like killing stuff and like, like you're like, oh, you're like, even that, that's completely fine. You can be rough like that with demons. You can be rough like that with the devil. But when you come to your spouse, when you come to other human beings, that toughness has to have a tenderness in you. Jesus said this, he says, for I am meek and gentle in heart. Jesus could stop the storm, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and yet he can also hold a child. He can also, the Bible says, the bruised reed he would not break, meaning there was a gentleness about him. And this was hard for me when we just got married because I thought because I was a virgin till 24 and I lived a holy life and I paid my taxes and I went to church, it gave me this license to be a jerk. I didn't see myself as a jerk. I just thought I was Jesus version 2. He went around throwing, throwing tables in the temple and it was my right to go and, you know, why didn't you wash the dishes? You know, why don't you wake up and pray? You know, like I walked in this righteous indignation like Elijah, you know, bringing fire down on people. And then the Lord had to really deal with my heart and He says that roughness is not the fruit of the Spirit. Harshness is not the fruit of the Spirit. And when disciples wanted to burn Samaria out of their passion for God, Jesus says, you guys don't know what your spirit you're in. That's not the heart and the passion of Jesus Christ. So some of you may be like, the crookedness is not your issue. And maybe the issue is not, you're not struggling with necessarily with pride or with this false humility, but you're just rough. You're snappy. To prepare for revival, you have to admit that today to your spouse, to your children, to your co-workers, to your employees. You have to admit that. Not only do you have to admit it to God and say, Lord, I'm going to go and we're going to start construction on my character. Because God's revival is not just you, Baramazda, Shara, Barahanda, and then you're acting like a jerk everywhere else outside of your prayer. God wants us to live in the way that we are in relationship with other people, in the way that we are in relationship with the world that reflects His image, that gives Him honor and glory. And at the same time prepares us to fully utilize our potential and God's purpose for our life. Prepare the way for the Lord. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.